Welcome to the Wings Over New Zealand show. I'm your host, Dave Homewood. Today, we've got a special 40th anniversary show uh, for marking the anniversary of the uh, Falklands War uh, in 1982. And uh, my guest today is Don Sims. Hi, Don. Hey, Dave. Now, you've been on the show a few times before, mainly talking about Skyhawks, and there's a little bit about Iroquois, but uh, you've got a presentation that you give on the air war in the Falklands. Yes, um, I put it together a couple of years ago for the Royal Aeronautical Society. I uh, had a meeting in Christchurch that I presented it to. And then I thought with the upcoming 40th anniversary of the Falklands War, I, I just um, modified a little bit to, for that and do some more presentations around the, the country. But COVID has sort of put those plans on hold. So I thought, well, maybe we should just put it online and anyone anywhere can watch it. So it's probably going to get a better, bigger audience. So, Yeah, fantastic. Well, um, take it away. Okay, I'll just present my screen. Sorry, it didn't go to the start. Right, you see that okay? Yes, yep. Cool. Okay, so yeah, welcome. I'm Don Sims from Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, as I said, yeah, I put this together a couple of years ago and uh, it got a pretty good reception when I did it, so I thought it's a good idea to get it out there and just share share it with the rest of the world. So, thanks for giving us the opportunity to do that, Dave. Um, so, first of all, I'd just like to give credit to uh, the photographers and and the, the material that I'm going to use in the presentation. None of it is mine, apart from the presentation to get itself. I've I've used photographs and maps and and information that's that's on public websites and and on places like Facebook. So I just want to credit the copyright holders and the people that took the photos originally, because as you can even see on the, the front screen here, there's some pretty spectacular footage and photographs from this conflict. And um, without them, yeah, I wouldn't be able to do this presentation. So thank you to those who, who did them and, and have put them online to make them available for others to use and see. So in April 1982, I was a 16 year old living in Invercargill, New Zealand. Uh, and I was mad on everything military and, and aviation. So the Falklands War really captivated me. Uh, I can remember watching the nightly news and, and being absolutely amazed by some of the footage and it still sits with me today as, as, as being something that really influenced me at the time, even though I was only quite young. Um, it sort of motivated me a bit to join the Air Force. And when I was 18, I joined the Royal New Zealand Air Force as an avionics technician and spent the next 18 years in the Air Force and worked mostly on the Air Force fast jets, the A4 Skyhawks at the time, of course, which Argentina used in the Falklands. Uh, since then, I've done a lot of reading on the Falklands conflict. Um, I've got probably just about every book that's ever been published, particularly on the air war. Um, and I continue to learn new things every day. It's, uh, there's more and more material coming online all the time. And as time goes on, some of the classified material from British archives in particular is being uh, declassified and released, which sort of fills gaps in some of the information. There's a couple of really great Facebook groups on the Falklands War um, on the British side, and I know there's also uh, Argentine groups as well, but my lack of Spanish probably stops me participating in those. But yeah, if you're interested, there's a lot of great material online there and some great discussion. So the Falklands War was a relatively short conflict. Argentina invaded the islands on the 2nd of April, 1982. But the real shooting war only went from the 1st of May to the 14th of June. Interesting, neither side officially declared war on each other, and the conflict was contained to a relatively small area of the South Atlantic. And no other nations became directly involved, although many provided material, intelligence, and logistics support to both sides. On this, the 40th anniversary of the war, there are still many important lessons for politicians, military planners, and logisticians. While this presentation focuses on the air war, we'll briefly touch on other aspects of the conflict as well that influenced the outcome, and I trust you'll find it interesting. Just, just a little bit of background to start with on where the Falklands is and, and a little bit about its history. The Falkland Islands have been a settled British territory since 1766. In Argentina, the islands are known as the Mal Malvinas. Argentina first took the islands by force in 1832 and the British retook them in 1833. So ownership has been a long-standing dispute between the two countries. 
1982, Argentina was ruled by a brutal military junta, a dictatorship. The country was on the brink of economic collapse. Annual inflation was running at 150% and unemployment 25%. And there were daily riots in the streets. Tens of thousands of Argentines had disappeared under the brutal rule of the military leaders and the Argentine people were very unhappy. The military leaders needed a distraction and the Falklands provided them with that. As you can see from that middle map, the Falkland Islands and South Georgia is a long way from England, about 8,000 miles. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was an awful long way to sail a task force and to support it with, with all your logistic chain back to the UK. The Argentine junta incorrectly assumed that the British would have no appetite for a war so far from home. At the time, the only British military presence in the Falklands was a few Marines and the ship HMS Endurance, which you can see on the top right there. Now she was an ice patrol ship, not really a warship. Uh, she was equipped with a couple of WASP helicopters, you can see one there, and had a few machine guns and that was pretty much her armament. Um, but she was also on her last sortie. She'd been sold to Brazil and was about to be sailed back to the UK to be decommissioned. That was part of the 1981 British defence cuts, which in particular the Royal Navy had suffered pretty severe cutbacks and was losing a significant number of its ships. So on the 2nd of April, in the early hours of the morning, the Falklands were invaded by Argentina. The small British garrison of 60 odd Royal Marines and local militia had been pre-warned the evening before and a poignant signal from the UK, invasion imminent, make dispositions accordingly. How 60 Marines were going to stop an invasion, I don't know. But they decided to give it a go and to try and give the Argentines a bloody nose, which they did. However, they were quickly overwhelmed by the much larger force and, and much bit, well, better armed for Argentine soldiers. Three Argentine soldiers were killed in the short fight for no British losses. South Georgia was invaded by the Argentines the next day. Two Argentine helicopters were shot down and a frigate badly damaged by the 12 man Royal Marine detachment there before they too surrendered. Over the next month, 13,000 Argentine troops were landed to garrison the islands. The majority, around 10,000, mostly conscripts, were positioned in the immediate area around the Falklands capital, Port Stanley. Led by the Iron Lady, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, the UK quickly resolved to retake the islands by force if necessary. In 1982, the Royal Navy was undergoing severe cuts as a result of the defence review a year earlier and many of its warships were about to be or had been decommissioned, sold or scrapped. The two-year-old aircraft carrier HMS Invisible was about to be sold to Australia and the heavy amphibious assault ships Fearless and Intrepid were in the process of being decommissioned. It wasn't much better for the RAF. The Vulcan bombers were just two months away from being retired and ironically Argentina had expressed an interest in purchasing some of them. Timing is everything. If the Argentines had waited six months, the British would arguably have not had the means to retake the islands. Within just three days of the invasion, the advance guard of the British task force sailed south. The voyage would take them two weeks. The task force would eventually comprise over 100 ships and 28,000 British military personnel and civilians. But the clock was ticking. Winter was fast approaching and the British commanders knew that if they couldn't retake the islands by the end of June, then they would likely have to withdraw the task force until spring due to the weather. Logistically, the supply chain back to the UK was horrendously long. The commanders knew that sustaining such a large task force that far from home for more than three months would be very difficult. The Falklands had to be recaptured as quickly as possible. Of the 100 British ships that took part in the operation, over 40 were civilian ships that were, and their crews that were requisitioned by the Ministry of Defence. They perform mainly support and logistics roles, but several were directly involved in the landing and were bombed by Argentine aircraft. One was sunk. So we'll now just look at the order of battle of the, the two sides and starting with the British. Only 26 of the 44 Sea Harriers on order for the Royal Navy had been delivered by the start of the conflict. The Sea Harrier had only just become operational in squadron service but none of the weapon release trials had yet been conducted and there were many modifications still being made to the Sea Harriers avionic systems. 
Nevertheless, two squadrons comprising 20 Sea Harriers were dispatched south on the two aircraft carriers, 12 on the larger Hermes and eight on Invincible. When they departed, a number of the pilots were not even debt qualified and most had done no night takeoff or landings yet. This included several RAF Harrier pilots who bolstered the numbers of Sea Harrier Navy pilots. Over the next two, two to three weeks, a lot of work was required to get both the aircraft and pilots operational, and this all had to be done as the task force sailed south. Note the peacetime colour schemes as the aircraft and ships depart the UK. As the ships sailed south, these bright markings were overpainted with a light gold grey colour, making the aircraft camouflage very effective. Initially, the Sea Arrows were equipped with the AIM-9G Sidewinder missile, which was an earlier version of the missile. But as the task force sailed south, the United States released the more capable all aspect AIM-9L version of the Sidewinder from their NATO stocks. And these were flown south to Ascension Island and then by helicopter out to the ships. What I mean by all aspect is the AIM-9L version could fire at a target head on. It didn't have to be chasing the aircraft to, to shoot it from behind. Um, the Sea Harrier could also carry various bombs and rockets in the ground attack role, and it had two 30 millimeter cannon and pods underneath the fuselage. It was capable of air to air refilling, uh, but there were no tankers available uh, that far south, so the, the probes were removed and was never used, apart from to ferry aircraft from the UK to Ascension Island. As the ship sailed south throughout April, an intensive workup began. The aircraft lost their peacetime paint schemes and all of the incomplete weapon trials were undertaken, including integrating and test firing the new AIM-9L Sidewinder missile. Initially, just 20 Harriers embarked on Hermes Invincible. A further eight were sent south as replacements for lost aircraft in May, as well as 10 RAF GR3 Harriers. In the photo on the right of HMS Invincible, you can see the RAF Harriers with the Royal Navy Har Sea Harriers the Sea Harrier had a radar in the nose and this RAF GR3 had a laser designator, so it had a slightly different shaped nose. The carriers were obviously a key target for the Argentines. Without them and the Harriers, there could be no landing. So move on to the Argentine order of battle now. Argentina had one aircraft carrier and it was called the 25 de Mayo, which stands for the 25th of May which is Argentina's national day and is a very important day in Argentina. She was an old World War II era ex Dutch Navy carrier and she had many engineering issues, including problems with her engines and the steam catapult. The catapult struggled to launch a fully loaded Skyhawk and it could only do so if there was a strong wind blowing. The Skyhawks were being in the, in the process of being replaced by French built Super Anton Dart aircraft but the carrier had not yet been modified to operate the new aircraft. It also operated SE-2 Grumman trackers and seeking helicopters in the maritime reconnaissance and anti-submarine warfare roles. Prior to the start of the conflict, the disparate Argentine services did not operate in a joint way. In particular, the Navy and Air Force had very little time for each other. The Navy were responsible for anything above, on or below the water. They had sole responsibility for maritime strike maritime surveillance and anti-submarine warfare. Consequently, the Air Force had no assets, experience or training in these maritime operations, which was something that was going to become quite important shortly. The A4Q Skyhawk was the fighter aircraft that the Argentine Navy operated from the carrier. They had received 16 second-hand ex-US Navy aircraft in 1972 five had been written off in accidents prior to the start of the conflict. Eight were serviceable at the start of the conflict and were deployed on the carrier for the first few weeks and then were land-based for the duration of the conflict. Unlike the British Sea Harriers, most retained their very highly visible peacetime colour schemes during the conflict. The A4Q pilots were highly trained and skilled in maritime strike, unlike their Air Force counterparts. The A4Q was a very early model Skyhawk, uh, had no radar, radar warning system, navigation systems. Uh, it was a very basic airplane. However, it was capable of air to air refueling, acting both as a tanker and as a receiver. 
the French manufactured Super Intendard had entered service only a few months before the start of the conflict, and only five aircraft and five Exocet missiles of the 14 of each on order had been delivered. One aircraft was cannibalized for parts to keep the others flying, and it could not yet operate from their carrier. The pilots and ground crew had only just received their training in France and were still learning how to operate the aircraft and its weapon system. They were capable of air-to-air -air refueling, which would be critical to their success in the coming conflict. It was the most capable Argentine weapon system and posed the greatest threat to the Royal Navy Task Force. Surprisingly, the British didn't try and take them out early in the conflict, although an SAS raid on their mainland base was planned but never undertaken. So just moving on to look at the Argentine Air Force. So listed there is the numbers of the different types of aircraft that were available at the start of the conflict. And while on paper Argentina could field 130 plus combat aircraft, in reality only about 70 were available and serviceable at the start of the conflict. And many of these were obsolete. The Mirages were only configured in the fighter interceptor role and they couldn't carry out ground attack or anti-shipping missions armed with radar-guided and heat-seeking missiles, on paper they presented a serious threat to the Harrier force. And in theory, they could engage the Harriers with their medium-range radar-guided missiles well outside the range of the Harriers' short-range heat-seeking missiles. The Dagger was an Israeli-manufactured copy of the French Mirage 5. It was a true multi-role aircraft, but like the Mirage, could not be refueled in flight, but severely restricted its combat capability. And that's just a photo of some of the other aircraft types. On the left there is the Pukara twin engine turboprop, uh, locally manufactured aircraft in Argentina. And um, they had many of those and it was about 40 deployed to the Falklands during the conflict. Um, top middle was a dagger with some pilots standing in front of it during the war. And on the right, a Canberra bomber, which Argentina had about eight of those. And the bottom is the Mirage three. And you can see that's fitted with two large underwing drop tanks, which it needed to get to the Falklands uh, to fight. Argentine, Argentine Air Force also had Skyhawks. They'd received 50 second-hand ex-US Navy A4B aircraft in the late 60s. And these were designated A4P. They only had three underwing hardpoints and very limited navigation and weapon systems. No radar, no radar warning system but they were capable of air-to-air -air refueling, which would be critical in the coming months. Around 36 were available at the start of the conflict, but they would suffer from poor serviceability and spare shortages throughout. But they had large numbers of airframes back at their home bases to cannibalize from. As you can see from the photos, they were very well camouflaged compared to their Navy compatriots. But early in the conflict, they and all of the Air Force jets were painted with high visibility identification markings, yellow bands. Later, these were changed to blue and eventually disappeared altogether. The Argentine Air Force also had 25 upgraded A4C Skyhawks, which they received in 1976. They were the most capable of all the Skyhawks, with five underwing hardpoints as opposed to three on the A4Ps and A4Qs. They had an Omega navigation system and upgraded weapons aiming site. However, they still had no radar or radar warning system. Around 19 were available at the start of the conflict. And again, their very effective camouflage was spoiled by the application of high-vis identification bands at the start of the conflict. And on the photo on the right there, you can see that with the underside of the drop tanks painted yellow and various other stripes and bands on the aircraft yellow. On the photo on the left, you can see those yellow bands have changed color to blue. And eventually they, they overpainted them with the camouflage when they realized they were a bit of a silly idea. Now the instrument panel photo there, the Omega navigation computer, you can see right in the middle of the instrument panel there. Argentina only had two C-130 tanker aircraft. The Skyhawks and Super Endondards would also be could also be configured as a tank tanker, but couldn't carry much fuel. The two C-130s provided to prove to be one of the most important strategic assets to the Argentine Air Forces during the conflict, and were in almost constant use supporting airstrikes from the 1st of May to the 14th of June. Again, it was surprising that the British made no attempt to take them out during the conflict, 
as had they done so, it would have severely limited how the Argentine Skyhawks and Super Engine Darts could have been used. The top three photos there are all photos from the Falklands War, taken from, or two of them taken from the C-130 of bombed up aircraft on their way to the Falklands. Just have a look at the Argentine mainland air bases now where they were in relation to the Falklands. Port Stanley's runway was too short to operate fast yet from safely. It was only just over 4,000 feet long. So the main Argentine fighters and bombers were forced to operate from mainland bases, which were about 350, 400 miles from the, main, from the islands. The islands are right at the limit of the unrefueled range for all of the Argentine combat jets when carrying weapons. The only aircraft that could venture east of the islands in search of the British fleet were the Skyhawks and Super Anton Dards using air-to-air -air refueling. The British calculated that by keeping the carriers more than 425 miles from the Argentine mainland bases, they would be safe from attack from the Argentine jets, which proved to be nearly correct. The Argentine bases at Rio Grande and Rio Galeos down the bottom of the country were just bare bases comprising just a runway and hard standing areas. Weather conditions at these sub-Antarctic latitudes was appalling at times, making life very difficult for the crews. In late April, the British task force arrived and established a 200 nautical mile total exclusion zone around the islands, which as you can see there circled around the islands. Any Argentine ship or aircraft found within it could be attacked. Surprisingly, the Argentines didn't put all of their similar aircraft types on a single base to pull logistics and personnel. For example, the Air Force and Navy Skyhawks were spread across three different bases. The Mirages and Daggers the same. Tasking for Air Force and Navy aircraft was done completely independently. As aircraft and pilots were lost in combat, replacements were sent south from the northern home bases as the aircraft were made service for and became available. The only sealed runway in the islands was at Stanley Airport. A detachment of four Argentine Navy Emaki 339As were deployed and operated from there throughout. However, the harsh environment and poor conditions meant the aircraft suffered from very poor serviceability. A large number of locally manufactured Pukara turboprops were flown to the islands and operated from Stanley Airfield in the grass strips at Goose Green and Pebble Island. The Pukaras were seen as a serious threat to the British land forces. So considerable effort was put into trying to destroy them before the British landed. The SAS made a nighttime raid on Pebble Island on the 15th of May and destroyed six Pukaras, four turbo mentors and one Skyvan transport aircraft. And that's the photograph at the top left. You can see the damage to the aircraft and to the runway. Several Pukaras were also destroyed and damaged in British air raids on the Stanley and Goose Green airfields. The photo top in the middle there is at Stanley Airport with the Pukaras in the background and the Argentine ground crew there are mixing napalm and putting it into the napalm tanks. And surprisingly, they did actually use, try and use that against the British forces as they advanced at Goose Green later on. Fortunately, without doing any harm to anyone. The Argentines also deployed large numbers of short range anti-aircraft missile and AAA anti-aircraft artillery systems to the islands. Some of these were radar guided, so very accurate. They also deployed two sophisticated US built mobile long range air defense radar systems. That's the one shown on the right there. These were a thorn on the side of the British for the duration of the conflict, providing accurate and timely warning of British aircraft movements. The British tried unsuccessfully to take them out on several occasions, including using borrowed US anti-radiation missiles fired from a Vulcan bomber. The radars and missiles were constantly moved around and were very well camouflaged and even placed deliberately by civilian buildings to deter attack. On the 26th of April, the British retook South Georgia. The Argentine submarine Santa Fe was caught on the surface by British Wessex and Wasp helicopters. She was depth charged and attacked with surface air missiles and strafed by machine guns. It was badly damaged and unable to dive and was scuttled and abandoned at the Sepulchre Wharf. The British lost two Wessex helicopters during the operation to take South Georgia due to appalling weather conditions. So on the 1st of May, the air war started proper. Just before dawn, a Vulcan bomber 
dropped 21,000 pound bombs from 12,000 feet on the airfield at Stanley. And then at dawn, 12 Sea Harriers attacked the airfields at Goose Green and Stanley, with one Sea Harrier suffering some minor damage to the fin from anti-aircraft fire. You see the hole in the fin in that photo. And then the uh, photo above it is taken from one of the Harriers strike camera, looking forward so you can see the runway uh, at Stanley there and the aircraft speed 447 knots at 100 feet. Um, and there's obviously a bit of smoke there from a previous bomb. And the bottom right photographs an aerial reconnaissance photo after the Vulcan attack, just showing where the Vulcan's bombs landed. They managed to get one on the runway and one right on the edge, and the rest were sort of walked through the Argentine logistics and storage areas at the airport. However, the, the damage to the runway was repaired within a few hours, and it was never actually put out of use by the British. The Argentines were very good at uh, repairing it. The Vulcan raid to get a Vulcan all the way from Ascension Islands to the Falklands was an absolute amazing achievement. The operation was called Black Buck and it required 13 air-to-air -air refuels from 11 different Victor tankers to get one Vulcan to the Falklands and safely back to Ascension Island, a round trip of 13,000 kilometres. They burned an astonishing combined total of 137,000 gallons of fuel to achieve that. A lot could go wrong and nearly did. During the conflict, five Black Buck missions were flown. The first one that we've just discussed being the most successful in terms of damage done. While the damage was minimal, the psychological effect was huge. If a Vulcan could bomb the Falklands, then it could also bomb Argentine bases on the mainland or even cities. As a result, after the 2nd of May, Argentina held back its Mirage fighters and they were tasked with protecting the mainland airfields, effectively taking them out of the conflict. While the Vulcan had originally been designed with the ability to deliver conventional bombs and air-to-air -air refuel, in its later years of area of service, both of these capabilities had been removed from the aircraft. In the weeks leading up to the first Black Buck raid, RAF maintenance personnel had to scrounge, borrow and beg the necessary parts to enable both capabilities again, including visiting gate guards, museums and scrapyards all over the world. Likewise, the crews had to retrain in the art of both capabilities, all in the space of just two weeks. Quite an incredible feat. This is the refueling plan that was required to get that one Vulcan all the way down from Ascension to the Falklands. And, and as you see, it was pretty complex and there wasn't much room for air. There was a couple of reserve Victor tankers in the, in the mix and there was also a reserve Vulcan. So two Vulcans took off, but only one completed the mission. And the the Vulcan also had to be refueled on the return flight home. So some of the tankers that took off and refueled on the way down south had to return to Ascension, refuel and take off again to go and meet the Vulcan to get it back to the Ascension afterwards. Quite an amazing um, a feat there. Uh, the photo on the left there, you can see a Shrike anti-radiation missile under the Vulcan. And that was one of those missiles that they tried to take out the Argentine radar systems with. The 1st of May also saw the first air-to-air -air combat between the Mirage and the Sea Harrier. After the Vulcan and Sea Harrier dawn raids, the Argentine Mirages flew a number of sorties from the mainland. However, due to the, the long distances, they were unable to descend to low level to engage the Sea Harriers. Um, however, at the end of the day, a combat finally did occur when a couple of Mirages descended tried to jettison their drop tanks. And I say try because on one of the aircraft it hooked up and it didn't release. And they engaged the Sea Harriers in a short dive fight. And the result was that two Mirages were destroyed and no Sea Harriers lost. After this, the Mirage force was withdrawn and to defend those mainland airfields. The Sea Harrier had won a significant psychological victory on the first day of the conflict. And that screenshot on the left is, is actually a hard shot from one of the Sea Harriers uh, firing a sidewinder at a target. So it wasn't actually on the 1st of May, this shot, but just gives you a look out the front of what the pilot saw. So the speed there is 477 knots, and they're only 360 feet above the sea. So it was uh, probably chasing a skyhawk going low and fast. On the 2nd of May, the Argentine Navy were preparing a classic pincer movement to try and trap and, and hit the British task force. To the north, they had their aircraft carrier group, 
uh, as well as a submarine and uh, Exocet equipped destroyers. And to the south, the Belgrano group with Exocet equipped ships. The Belgrano was a World War II ex US Navy cruiser uh, that the Argentines operated. She'd actually survived the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. So she was a pretty old ship. Um, but their intention that day was to locate the British task force and they would all try and attack the task force at the same time. And it was going to include Super Endon Dards operating from the main end as well, as you can see there. But for various reasons, it, it didn't happen. And, and the main reason was they, they were still trying to find each other. The British were looking for the Argentine task force and the Argentines likewise. And even though the Argentine aircraft had detected the British carriers, um, by the time they, they could have launched a strike, it was too late in the day and they had to wait till the next day. And by then the Belgrano had been sunk by a British submarine. And after that, the carrier and the rest of the naval ships quickly headed back to port. Again, the British had won a major psychological victory by sinking the Belgrano. The sinking of Belgrano was quite controversial at the time because she was torpedoed outside of the total exclusion zone. So I guess, yeah, in some ways, yeah, the Argentines thought they were safe by sitting out there where they were, but the British recognised the threat that she posed uh, and wanted to send a very clear message to the Argentine Navy. On the 2nd of May, there was almost a carrier to carry air battle when the carriers of both sides came within 200 miles of each other. The British didn't know the location of the Argentine carrier, but the Argentine tracker aircraft from the 25th of May had located the British fleet. It was only a lack of wind that prevented the Skyhawks from being launched on what would have been the world's first carrier versus carrier combat since World War II. And that photo on the right is taken on the 2nd of May on the ship. And you can see the bombs ready to be loaded up, um, suitably marked for HMS Invincible. But again, the, the poor condition of that ship and the, particularly its steam catapult, it just couldn't launch a fully loaded Skyhawk. And that was the only reason it didn't happen. However, the Argentine got the Argentinians got their revenge on the 4th of May. HMS Sheffield was hit and sunk by an Exocet missile, killing 20 of her crew. Also that day, a Sea Harrier was shot down by AAA at Goose Green Airfield while it was attacking the airfield and the pilot was killed. HMS Sheffield was on radar picket duty to the southeast of the islands with two other Type 42 destroyers protecting the British task force from air attack. Two Super Anton Dards guided to the area by an Argentine Navy P-2 Neptune approached at low level and launched two Exocets, only one of which found its target, HMS Sheffield. 20 of Sheffield's crew were killed and the ship was abandoned and left to burn out. It later sank while under tow back to the UK. The loss of Sheffield was a huge shock to the British who were caught totally by surprise by the Exocet attack. Neither the Interdards or their Exocets were detected by Sheffield's radars. Although the radar emissions of both the aircraft and missiles had been detected by several other British ships, but they were not assessed as a threat. And part of the reason for that was the British also had the Exocet uh, on their ships. And of course the radar and the missile was identical to the air launch. So the, the computers on the ship identified the Exocet as a friendly missile rather than a threat. The first warning of the attack on Sheffield was when an officer on the bridge saw the incoming missile just five seconds before it impacted. The British naval air defences included some of the most modern surface-to-air missile systems in the world, right through to the most basic rifles and machine guns strapped to the ship's railings. Sea Dart, which is the missile system being fired in the middle and bottom left, was a new medium-range missile system fitted to many of the British ships. It was designed for engaging aircraft flying at medium to high altitude, but could not engage targets at ultra-low level. The Argentine Navy also had Sea Dart on two of their destroyers, so were well aware of its strengths and weaknesses. Of the 31 Sea Darts fired in anger by the British, only six kills were achieved, pretty poor result for a modern missile. Sea Wolf, which is the missile system on the bottom right, was a brand new point defense missile system designed for countering ultra low level attacks, including intercepting sea skimming missiles like Exocet. Initially, it was only fitted to two warships in the task force, 
and these tended to be kept close to the carriers to defend them from attack. They were known as goalkeeper ships because you know, they were the sacrificial lamb to save the carrier. For the seven missiles fired in anger, it was credited with three confirmed kills. The most numerous anti-aircraft missile system fitted to the British ships was SeaCat, which is the missile being launched top left. It was an elderly design from the 1950s. It was a short range point defense system and Seawolf had been designed to replace it. It was visually guided to the target by its operator, but proved to be highly unreliable, being credited with only two kills from the 40 odd missiles fired. 40 millimeter Bofors guns, like the one on the top right, and 20 millimeter cannons and machine guns, manually aimed, struggled against the low flying high speed targets. And later on, there were many machine guns and rifles issued to men that just came out onto the, the, the decks of the ship and fired at the aircraft as they attacked in a desperate last ditch attempt to hit them. While they didn't have much success, it probably made the guys on the ships feel better shooting back. Between the 5th of May and the 20th of May, uh, when the, the British landed on the 21st, both sides sort of probed each other's defences, feeling each other out. Uh, but there were some quite significant um, strikes on the British task force by the Argentine jets. And the photos in, the, in this slide above, HMS Glasgow is under attack. Both photos have been taken from HMS Broadsword. Um, both ships were struck by 1,000 pound bombs dropped by the Skyhawks, but they both failed to explode, passing right through the ships and coming out the other side and falling into the sea harmlessly. However, a thousand pound bomb, even when it doesn't explode, can cause a lot of internal damage to a ship due to its kinetic energy. HMS Glasgow was effectively put out of action in this attack and had to return to the UK for repairs, even though the bomb didn't explode. The photo on the right there of the two Skyhawks attacking HMS Broadswords, an amazing photo and probably one of the most famous from the war, um, with outgoing fire from the ship being aimed at the aircraft and probably incoming rounds from the Skyhawks as well. The guy who stood there and took that photo was a pretty brave man. This was the damage that was done to Broadsword after this attack. A bomb passed through the side of the ship, came up through the flight deck, taking off the nose of the Lynx helicopter as the bomb went past and then fell into the sea beyond, miraculously without exploding. Also note the holes in the side of the ship from the 20 millimeter cannons fired from the Skyhawks. The Argentine Dagger aircraft was the only one that had a gun sight with a, a gun uh, strike camera fitted. Um, so they captured some incredible footage in uh, movie and still footage of the low level attacks on the British ships and just a sample here. Uh, these attacking aircraft are between probably 20 to 30 feet above the sea. And, and as you can see, they're pretty damn low. Um, the splashes in the water in most cases are actually the shells from the aircraft's 30 millimeter cannon, which are in the belly of the aircraft underneath. And because they were shot so low, they were firing those shells virtually straight into the water in front of them. They needed to actually lift the nose a bit to get a bit higher to get the shells to hit the ships. But yeah, it just gives you an insight to the the bravery of those pilots, because um, there would have been as many bullets and shells and missiles coming the other way towards them. On the 21st of May, the British landed, and they landed in a small sheltered bay called San Carlos, which is a good photograph there on the right of what San Carlos looks like. Uh, it's just off Falkland Sound, which is between the two main Falkland West and East Islands. Um, and it was chosen because of its sheltered nature from the weather. It was very important that the, the landing was done during um, good weather uh, and ha having a sheltered bay like that just made it a little bit easier. The area was also found to be uh, not well defended by Argentine troops. Over the coming days, the British landed 10,000 troops and all their equipment in San Carlos. So it was a massive effort to get that army ashore uh, safely and uh, with all their gear that they needed. Um, and that's the bottom left photo there, sort of dawn uh, the next day, just of all the British ships in that bay. And that was the site that would have greeted the Argentine defenders up on the hill. 
when the sun came up, the British ships were already there and already landing, and there wasn't much they could do about it. But the Argentine air response was severe. From around midday on the 21st, the Argentines attacked San Carlos ferociously and continuously. They flew more sorties on this day than any other during the conflict, and some spectacular photos and footage was captured of these attacks. The following slides show some of them. Because of the terrain, the Argentine pilots had just seconds to line up the target and drop their bombs, making accurate weapon, weapon delivery very difficult. Many bombs missed, or when they did hit a target, failed to explode due to being dropped too low. Their fuses didn't have time to arm. During the conflict, nearly half of all Argentine sorties tasks were aborted due to aircraft serviceability issues, bad weather, or interception by the sea harriers. The ones that did get through, uh, as you can see, they were flying extremely low to, to try and avoid the British radars and missile systems. There's the photo in the middle at the top there, the black and white one, if you look between the, the masts of that ship, you'll see there's a dagger aircraft zooming past just there. And your speed was life. If you uh, went high and went slow, then you were going to be dead because the missiles would get you or the sea harriers. And just some more shots of bombs, near misses of the ships, uh, and some on land as well. Now, there's a little video clip here I'll play from YouTube. And we don't think there's going to be any sound from it, so I'll just talk you through it. But it gives you an idea of the impression of the, the speed of the attacking aircraft, the low altitude they're at. And, and you'll also see splashes in the water behind the aircraft where people from the ships are shooting at them, but the fall of shot is falling behind them because of the speed. So we'll just uh, go to that now. Sorry, I'm just going to have to stop presenting and represent. Hopefully you can see this. So that's a Skyhawk attacking. And you can see the shots falling behind it in the water. If we had sound, you'd better hear the British anti-aircraft guns and machine guns all firing away at it and missiles as well. That's a CCAT missile being fired. And you'll see there the British helicopters flying around in amongst all of that going on. So, yeah, pretty scary for the pilots and, and everyone on those ships as well, I imagine. Yeah, quite incredible. Yeah, I'll just reshare my presentation. Can you see that again, Dave? Yep, that's up. Yep, cool. Um, as well as the ship-based air defences, the British landed uh, very on on the early on in the landing um, rapier missile defence batteries, which is the missile on the bottom left and top right there. Um, rapier was a fairly new missile system. Um, it was a hit-aisle missile, and what I mean by that is it, it actually had to hit the aircraft that it was being fired at, whereas most anti-aircraft missiles were uh, proximity fused, so you didn't actually have to hit the target. You just got near it and sensors detected the aircraft and then the warhead would be um, armed and exploded and the shrapnel flying out would hit the aircraft, but not with rapier. Rapier, you actually had to hit the aircraft, which as you can imagine from that footage is pretty damn hard at something that's going 500 and something mile an hour, so low and maneuvering, very, very difficult. And it was a visually guided missile as well. So unfortunately it didn't do too well on the Falklands um, of, I think there was 60 odd missiles fired 61 fired in anger, and it was only credited with one kill. And as well as the rapiers, the British had a lot of shoulder launched blowpipe and stinger missiles. And uh, the photo at the top in the middle there is a blowpipe missile in St. Carlos with a guy trying to aim it at something. Again, had a very poor success rate in the Falklands. Of the 100 weapons that were fired by the British, it was only credited with two confirmed kills. 
And both of those were rather slow flying aircraft, not fighters. Soldiers firing machine guns and rifles fired tens of thousands of rounds at attacking aircraft from both the ships and on shore with little success, but I'm sure it made them feel better being able to fight back. On the 21st of May, HMS Ardent, a Type 21 frigate was sunk. It was hit several times by daggers and skyhawks and all the bombs went into the stern of the ship and eventually she sunk that day, taking 22 of her crew with her. On the 23rd of May, HMS Antelope, another Type 21 frigate, was hit by 2,000 pound bombs dropped by Skyhawks. Uh, neither bomb exploded, uh, so they sailed the ship into San Carlos to try and defuse the bomb bombs. Um, the photo top right there, you can see there's a hole in the side of the ship, and that was where one of the bombs went in. There was a similar hole on the other side, uh, further forward under the bridge. Um, you'll see in that artist's impression on the left, there's a skyhawk that's flying over and appears to have hit something on the ship and is on fire. And it did, it, it was so low that it actually hit the aft mast of the ship. And you can see that's bent and buckled on the photograph on the right. The next day, unfortunately, while, or that night, while the bomb disposal guys were trying to defuse the bombs, one of them exploded uh, and killed two of the guys that were doing it. Fortunately, the most of the crew had been taken off as a precaution, which was just as well. Uh, the next morning, that was the site that greeted everyone in San Carlos with the uh, antelope on fire, split in half and eventually sunk on the sink on the 24th. On the 25th of May, which you remember is Argentina's National Day, uh, the British were expecting a major effort and a few surprises and they weren't disappointed. Um, the Argentines planned and flew a number of coordinated attacks from multiple bases. HMS Coventry and HMS Broadsword were on radar picket duty to the North Islands, acting as early warning for airstrikes. And these were attacked by Skyhawks and Coventry was struck by three 250 kg bombs, which exploded within the ship. And the photograph top middle there is actually of the impact of those bombs as they exploded. And that was taken from the bridge of Broadsword, which was sailing alongside. The bombs basically blew out the bottom of the ship and she keeled over and sank within 20 minutes, taking 20 of her crew with her. Also that day, the Super Interdards uh, made a sortie to try and catch the British carriers. I'll just go back to the previous slide in that map. So they did, they did a big detour around the north of the Falklands and tried to come in on the carriers from the north, an unexpected direction of attack. Um, they popped up when they thought they were in about the right position to be able to acquire them on radar. And they detected a large uh, vessel on their radar as well as several smaller ships around it. So they assumed that was one of the carriers. They launched both of their exosets and departed. However, um, while HMS Hermes was in the vicinity, the, the exosets had locked onto the container ship Atlantic conveyor, which was being used to transport British aircraft and supplies and materials to the Falklands. Um, fortunately for the British, all of the Harrier jets that you can see in the photo on the right and one of the Chinook helicopters had been flown off. So they were safe, but everything else that was on the ship, including about another six helicopters and all of the stores and ammunition that was gonna be needed for the landings was lost when that ship was hit by the two exosets. 12 of the ship's crew were killed in the attack and most of them were civilians. The loss of the Atlantic conveyor would have a major impact on the British land campaign because the plan had been to fly the troops from San Carlos towards Stanley. Now they were going to have to walk all the way carrying everything on their backs. On the 30th of May, a joint Navy and Air Force strike on the British carriers was attempted using the last Exocet air launch missile. As you can see from the map there, again, they did a, a major big detour dog leg around the bottom of the Falklands to try and attack the target carriers from an unexpected direction from the south. There was two Super Andodards and four A4 Skyhawks in the attack group, and they all refueled from the two C1T tankers south of the island. And those photographs there of the Andodard and Skyhawk refueling are taken on that day. The Intendards located a large radar target surrounded by smaller targets and launched their exoset at a range of 20 miles. 
the Skyhawks followed the Exocet smoke trail to the target. To this day, the Argentines claim they hit HMS Invincible with both Exocet and bombs dropped from the Skyhawks, but the British deny this, saying the attack was against the frigate HMS Avenger and both the Exocet and Skyhawks missed their target. The Exocet was successfully decoyed away by chaff fired by the British ships and two Skyhawks were shot down by sea darts. HMS Invincible wasn't too far away from the action, but there's no evidence to support the Argentine claims that she was sunk. It wasn't the first time in the campaign that the Argentines claimed to have sunk one of the carriers. The next major action involving loss to the British was on the 8th of June when the two uh, landing ships, Sir Galahad and Sir Tristram, which were unloading troops and stores at a place called Bluff Cove for the final attack on Stanley, and Skyhawks caught both ships undefended in broad daylight and hit them both hard. 48 British troops and sailors were killed with many hundred more injured. And from that TV footage from 1982, I vividly remember the footage from that day of badly burned troops and even some people with missing limbs being, being rescued from the life rafts and brought ashore. It was the worst day for the British in terms of losses, very sad. And it was quite an, av an, an avoidable loss as well to send two ships like that uh, unarmed effectively in broad daylight undefended was just silly and asking for trouble. On the 12th of June uh, in the nighttime, HMS Glamorgan was close to shore near Stanley providing shore bombardment support to the British troops attacking. Um, the Argentines by then had run out of the air launched Exocet missiles, but they still had a lot of them on their ships. And so they removed some of the launches, the radar systems and flew them out to the islands and set them up on trailers, pointing out to sea, hoping they would catch a British ship close in shore. And they did um, on this day, Glamorgan was hit by a single Exocet uh, and you can see where it had hit on the side of the ship on the left hand side where the hangar for the helicopter was. Did a lot of damage to the ship and it killed 13 of her crew. But she was a, an old ship. She was made of steel and very strong and sturdy. Um, unlike some of those earlier ships that we showed that were sunk, where their structures were made of aluminium and burned very well. Glamorgan um, being steel wasn't quite as vulnerable. As the war progressed and the situation for the Argentine forces got more and more desperate, they resorted to some quite desperate but ingenious measures to fight the British. This included converting a C-130 Hercules to a bomber by fitting a modified Skyhawk bomb rack and six 500 pound bombs to it. A gun sight from the Picara aircraft was installed as, in the cockpit as an aiming device. And you can see the bombs there on the underwing pylon. Um, those rocket launchers were used on the islands to try and um, suppress the British troops as they were advancing. The aircraft rocket launchers that were mounted on anything they could find. The Hercules bomber, however, did have some success. Two uh, oil tankers were attacked by it, and one of them, ironically called the Hercules, was sunk by the Hercules bomber eventually. Um, but neither of these tankers were involved in the, the British uh, logistics effort. They were just civilian tankers that were transiting through the South Atlantic um, and unfortunately were in the wrong place at the wrong time. So on the 14th of June, the war was over, the Argentine forces on the island surrendered. But it was just in the nick of time for the British. Winter had set in and the logistics supply train was about to break. The British artillery had fired their last rounds on the final day of the advance. They'd run out of ammunition and the task force ships were in a similar state. Out of ammunition and supplies, many ships had broken down and all were suffering in the harsh conditions. So we'll just quickly look at the uh, losses from both sides in terms of the aircraft. So as you can see there, the Argentine forces uh, lost nearly 100 aircraft of all types to all causes, including 26 aircraft that were captured on the Falklands at the end of the war. And this comprised mostly helicopters uh, and the Pucara aircraft that were left there. But you can see that the A4 Skyhawks suffered the most losses uh, of all the combat jets. 21 Skyhawks were lost. And out of that, only three pilots survived through ejection. So yeah, a pretty bad survival rate. But the, the fact that so many were lost reflects that the numbers that Skyhawks flew more sorties than any other type during the war. 
um, and suffered the consequences, I guess. However, it wasn't all one way, and the British also lost quite a few aircraft, a total of 34, uh, including six Sea Harriers, although none were shot down uh, in the air-to-air -air combat. They were all lost through accidents or uh, ground fire. A lot of helicopters were lost, as well as the ones on Atlantic Conveyor. Um, every British ship that was sunk had a, a Lynx helicopter on the back of it. Most of those were lost with those ships as well. In the air-to-air -air combat, the Sea Harrier had a 23 to nil um, success rate. So you can't argue with that statistic. Um, 19 of those kills were by the AIM-9L Sidewinder, 30 by the 30, sorry, three by the 30 mil cannon, and one was a combination of both Sidewinder and cannon. A total of 26 Sidewinders were fired in anger, 20 of which hit their target, which gave a probability of kill of 65%. By comparison, the Sidewinder in the Vietnam War had a probability of kill of just 18%, and in the later 1991 Gulf War, just 54%. So this the Sea Harrier Sidewinder combination did pretty well. Undoubtedly, the Sea Harrier Sidewinder combination played a significant role in the final outcome of the war. Uh, even if they didn't shoot aircraft down, the mere fact that they were present deterred a lot of Argentine air attacks. They, they dropped their jettisoned these weapons and turned for home if they were told there were sea harriers about. Uh, casualties, the British lost 255 killed and 777 wounded. Three Falkland Islanders were killed and the Argentinians lost 649 killed and 1188 wounded. And you may be wondering what that Kiwi pilot is doing standing beside his bombs on a Skyhawk. Um, his name is Alan Curtis, and he was an RNZF Skyhawk pilot in the 70s. And then in the late 70s, he left the RNZF to join the Royal Navy and, and went on to fly Sea Harriers in the Falklands. And Al was unfortunately killed in an accident during a conflict when two Sea Harriers were believed to have collided in mid-air at night time, and both pilots were killed. So that was a little uh, New Zealand connection. So in seven weeks, a task force of 28,000 men and over 100 ships was assembled and sailed 8,000 miles. It fought off combat aircraft that outnumbered its own by six to one. It put 10,000 men ashore on a hostile coast and fought several pitched battles against the enemy and brought them to a surrender within three and a half weeks. And you add all that up and you think that is an amazing achievement. Uh, and it was. Let's give credit where credit is due. Uh, the British did extremely well. However, they had a few things going in their favour. Um, one of them was the Sea Harrier um, and also a fair amount of luck. If you read a lot of the books on the Falklands, even from the British side, they'll admit they were bloody lucky. Um, a lot of things could have gone the other way um, and they could have, uh, could have been a different outcome. After the Falklands War, the British sort of learnt their lesson and uh, reinforced and garrisoned the Falkland Islands. Uh, they built a a big new military airfield there, which you can see the, the Mount Pleasant complex. And they stationed um, detachments of fighter jets down there, initially F-4 Phantoms, and then later Tornado F-3s. Uh, and these days, uh, Typhoon jets uh, regularly deploy down there just to act as a de deterrent to Argentina. However, Argentina is their Navy and Air Force today is a mere shadow of itself, uh, and they virtually have no capability to, to invade or or seriously threaten the Falklands these days, despite their sabre rattling. I'm sure over the next few months with the 40th anniversary, you'll hear a lot more sabre rattling from Argentina, but the reality is you know, they just don't have the capability to do it anymore. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, normally I'd ask questions, but being that this is an online <laughs> version of it, um, Dave, have you got any questions perhaps? Um, well, first I just want to say, Fantastic presentation. I, I learned quite a lot there. Um, I was only 11 when the war happened and didn't really follow it too closely. And it's only in uh, probably the last year that I've, I've started to really pay proper attention to it um, with the, the book uh, um, Vulcan 607. Um, I got the, uh, the audio version of that given to me and I listened to that. And uh, I'm also halfway through uh, Harrier 809, which is the both amazing books by yeah. Roland White. Um, 
they tell an incredible story and, and I'm just blown away. Um, one question I do have is, do you think now, uh, if something happened like happened in 1982, could the British forces do the same thing? What is, like their Navy seems to have been run down, their Air Force seems to have been run down. Do you think yeah, they, they have historically since the Falklands. You know, they, they prior to the Falklands, they were going through that same cycle of cutbacks. Yeah. Um, when the after the Falklands, all those cuts were stopped, and all those ships that were being sold and scrapped and decommissioned, all of a sudden they were saved, uh, and there was a lot more money invested in defence in Britain as a result. But as time's gone on over the last forty years, memories fade, and unfortunately, politicians have very short memories. And yeah, if you looked at the the Navy in particular now in the UK in terms of numbers of ships and their capability, I think they would struggle. But they, again, they're in a cycle at the moment of reinvestment um, yep. across defence in the UK. Like you, you see their two big new aircraft carriers yep. that they just bring into service uh, with the F-35s on them. So I think, yeah, they've got those which could certainly take on anything in the world anywhere. Um, but the, in terms of numbers of ships, yeah, they definitely don't have the quantity that they had back in 82. And like I said, they were just so lucky that it happened when it did, because if it had been six months later, most of those ships would have gone and they yeah. just wouldn't have had, had them to do it. The amphibious assault ships would have been gone. The car one of the carriers would have been gone. Well, and of course, the, um, the Argentine pilots would have been much more up to speed with their new in uh, Yeah, and they would have had all of, all of the intendards and all of the yep. sets would have been delivered. Uh, yep. Yep, could have been quite different. Um, an, an important lesson for the military planners today and politicians is you go to war with what you have at the time and you don't get to choose when. <laughs> These yeah. things do happen and catch everyone out. Like the, this caught British, the British government out um, really badly. Um, for some months, there'd been sort of noises being made by Argentina mm. about it, but the fact that they actually did invade really caught Britain by surprise. And you go to war with what you've got on the day. And, and Britain was just lucky that they still had those ships and crews uh, around and were able to bring a lot of other ships out of um, mothballs basically and, and crew them with experienced crew because they had the, the reserves and the capability to bring them in. I think if it was a case of six months later, the British government would have just said, well, let them have it because- Yep, and a uh, different leader as well, like Margaret yep. Thatcher, you know, she yep. was called the Iron Lady for a reason. She was adamant right from the start that they were going to retake the islands, even yeah. though all her official advisors were telling her, we can't, we don't have the capability. Yeah. Um, there was one meeting very early on where um, Sir Henry Leach, I think his name was, the first sea lord, was in, or he invited himself to this meeting of all these defence chiefs. And the, all the defence chiefs were saying, no, we can't do it, we can't do it, we haven't got the capability. And he came in there and he said, that, Maggie, I can get a task force underway in 48 hours. Just tell me, go. <laughs> and, she, and she said, go. <laughs> and, and they did. And, and how they assembled that task force so quickly, it was Easter time when it first happened. So, you know, everyone was on leave. All the British Armed Forces were on leave. Um, they had to recall everyone. And then they had to figure out what ships they had and what they needed. And, and they called all those civilian ships up and a lot of them were converted. They had to have helicopter decks welded onto them and um, cruise ships were brought in, ferries. Yeah, and it was an incredible feat by the dockyards as well to, to do all that in such a short space of time. Yeah, it, it is amazing. It, yeah. It, I mean, um, war does strange things, I guess. Uh, suddenly money's available when there's war. Yeah, and, well, it was the same for Argentina. Argentina had no money, they were broke. Yeah. But they were out there trying to buy exosets. <laughs> you know, when, when they knew they were going to run out of air-launched exosets, they were going around the world to all the countries that had them, yeah. trying to acquire them, and trying to acquire a lot of other military equipment as well. And while a lot of that is still classified and there's rumours, but, but certainly some countries supported them. Um, uh, not Chile, one of the South American countries offered to send combat aircraft. And in the end, they, they actually gave them all of their Mirage F5 uh, dagger aircraft, but as replacements for the Argentine aircraft. And Israel also provided quite a bit of uh, material spares support for Mirage and daggers and Skyhawks. Okay, interesting. Um, one thing that you mentioned uh, was HMS Invincible was 
sold to the Australians. Now, mm. what happened after the war? Did they did they get that carrier? No, I didn't think and so. Australia's aircraft carrier in 1982 was HMS Melbourne, which operated Skyhawks at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and because they'd signed up a deal to buy Invincible, um, the Melbourne was actually retired and scrapped. And yeah, and their Skyhawks eventually got scrapped as well because the Skyhawks weren't going to be able to operate from Invincible because it had a, a ski ramp uh, for Harriers for launching them. And initially the Australians weren't buying sea Harriers, but the yeah. Navy hoped that they would eventually. But no, it didn't happen. So the Australians never got their carrier. The British decided to keep Invincible. Interesting. So they had to pay the money back and... I guess so, yeah. <laughs> Um, so basically, as a result of Argentina invading the Falklands, New Zealand got another Skyhawk squadron. Sort of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the writing had been on the wall for the Aussie Navy Skyhawks for a while, but yeah, yeah it didn't help. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Actually, New Zealand was the only Commonwealth country that offered combat uh, personnel to the British to go and help. Oh, wow. um, there's Mark, Margaret Thatcher was very appreciative of uh, old Piggy Muldoon, the Prime Minister. He straight away offered up a fully armed and manned frigate and said, we'll, we'll send it to the Falklands. Um, and we were the only Commonwealth country that did that. Uh, but that offer was declined and instead the fr our frigate was sent to the Middle East to replace a British frigate that was then sent to the Falklands. So right. we just took over what they were doing. In the right. I had heard that. That was uh, HMNZS Wellington, I think, wasn't it? Um, yeah, I can't remember would it be Waikato or Canterbury back then. I think we only had two Leander frigates then. Okay, okay. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. Ma Ma Margaret Thatcher was very appreciative. New Zealand just straight away stood up and said, we'll send you whatever you want and, and man it. And yeah, no qualms. Interesting, yeah. But I guess, yeah, we were a small island nation as well and could see yeah, some similarities with the Falklands there. But, um, <laughs> Plus, on those days, our nearest um, neighbour, Australia, is probably never going to invade us. But yeah, yeah. But uh, um, in those days, of course, Britain was our biggest trading partner too, wasn't it? I think as well. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, and yeah, I think we'd just gone through the common market, the whole European Union fiasco, where all of a sudden tariffs were put on our meat and wool and butter and everything that was going to the UK, yeah. and the UK had effectively just shafted us economically. Yeah. But here we were, we still stood up. And, and put all that aside and offer to frigate. Yeah, well, there's always some sort of um, quid, was it quid quo pro down the track when you offer something like that? They're probably hoping for something back. So. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I guess we got some favours perhaps from them later on yeah. after the war because of our stance. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, when I was in the Air Force and on Skyhawks based in Nara, Australia in 91, 92, we had two Argentine Air Force Skyhawk pilots turn up and we took them flying. Um, they were in the process of purchasing and upgrading some Skyhawks from the United States and, and wanted to have a look at our Skyhawks and the Kahu upgrade we'd done on ours and then yep. wanted to sort of see how it operated in a maritime strike environment. Yep. So they yeah, flew back seat in a couple of our Skyhawks doing maritime strike sorties against the Australian Navy. Um, and I remember both strapping them in, they both had the, the Falklands War shoulder patches on. They were combat veterans. <laughs> that's that's really interesting. <laughs> It was, yeah. They didn't speak much English from memory, but right. <laughs> they yeah, had good war stories. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Fascinating. And in the end, Argentina did do a, an avionics weapon upgrade on their Skyhawks, almost identical to what we did on Kahu. Um, they actually copied a lot of it. <laughs> they used the same uh, equipment, same radar, the F-16 radar, and um, actually copied a lot of what we did. And those Skyhawks are still flying today in Argentina. Not many of them, but um, that's that's all they have these days as combat aircraft is a few Skyhawks. Right, right. Uh, one other Kiwi connection with the um, Falklands Air War that uh, I've picked up on from Vulcan 607 is that back in Britain in the uh, hierarchy of the Royal Air Force, one, one of the actual commanders that did a lot of the planning for the entire uh, air effort was Sir Kenneth Hayer. Um, mm. And of course, you know, I really didn't know anything about that. I knew he was a Warbird pilot uh, after he'd retired yeah. and came to New Zealand and unfortunately was killed a few years ago. But um, it's, yeah, it, it's just a shame that, uh, 
you know, he's not still around. I'd love to interview him about. Yeah, he would have been a very interesting person to interview. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You get a, a taste of what it was like for those sort of senior officers and planners in some of those books. Some of the infighting that went on between the services before yeah. the war and then even during it, there was quite a lot of business, particularly between Navy and Air Force, uh, before and definitely during the war, and even probably after, because yeah. Everyone was trying to grab their piece of the, the coin, the gold that the government was throwing around to save the military after the war. Um, the infighting that went on then actually wasn't that dissimilar to what happened in New Zealand in 2000, 2001, when we lost the Air Combat Force. It was exactly the same in New Zealand where the, the military chiefs were fighting amongst themselves to try and yep. secure capability and, and replace equipment. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the same was happening in the UK. Yeah, that's... Uh... It, it's actually it's it's really interesting to um, you know come across his story and, and the fact that he was one of the the big strategists that was involved and um, it's it's neat to have that Kiwi input to the story. Mm. So um, and I think he was also involved in the Gulf War, the 1991 yep. Gulf War as well. So um, but yeah, I mean fascinating presentation. Some of those photos are incredible, absolutely incredible. Aren't they? Yeah, and like I said, you know. Due credit to who took the people that took them originally, and then you know whoever owns the copyright now, they're all over the internet, and, and I and I've used them in this because they're just amazing photographs. Yeah. And absolutely. some of the video footage, if you look on YouTube, is great as well. Even though the camera technology at the time you know, was pretty basic, wasn't digital, um, but yeah, some of the footage is just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I also uh, I want to give a shout out to um, extended podcasts. They've in recent years done several episodes uh, with um, Falklands War veterans and they've got some great episodes uh, in their archive. Uh, people like Sharky Ward, who was a Harrier pilot yep. and um, yeah, there's several others there as well. Um, so yeah, if you, if you want to hear more podcasts, uh, I highly recommend Extended for the British podcast. Yep, uh, there is some great material out there online and you know, books, like I said, there's some very good books and they're, they're coming out all the time. There's, I guess people are getting to an age where they think if I don't write this down, it's going to be lost. And and there's also some other researchers writing some very good books. Yep, absolutely. And when you think about it, it's 40 years ago now um, since the, the conflict and the guys who were in it, uh, they'll be you know in their late 60s, um, mm. getting into some of them in their 70s. So, you know, they, the, this is the time to really make sure that it's recorded before it's uh, yep. before it's gone. And unfortunately, we haven't many uh, veterans left at all from World War II in Korea um, and Malaya even. Um, and um, so, yeah, these more recent wars, and it's not really that recent, 40 years, but um, we think of them as recent. Uh, it's something to remember and um, make sure that these sort of things don't happen again. Mm. Actually, I just remembered another story I should have said earlier. Um, in 1983, so only less than a year after the Falklands War, um, HMS Invincible and a Sea Harriers came to New Zealand for a visit. Um, right. So they were fresh out of the, the Falklands and all their victories, and, and I'm sure talking up, up the, the whole thing pretty much at the bar. Um, but as Invincible sailed into New Zealand waters, 75 Squadron Skyhawks went out and attacked it, which was a traditional way of welcoming anyone that visited New Zealand. Yeah. Um, and those New Zealand Skyhawks were, were very similar to the Argentine ones. They were pre-Kahu updates, so they had virtually no radar or systems that helped the pilot. But we managed to sneak up on Invincible and attack that ship without being detected. Yeah. And there was a hastily prepared meeting when Invincible arrived in Wellington where the Scott pilots had to all go down to Wellington and explain how they did it because Invincible <laughs> was very embarrassed <laughs> and those Sea Harriers then were based at Ahakia for the next week or so uh, and flew air combat against their Skyhawks and again they were quite embarrassed after that right. while they were fighting a, an old technology aeroplane they were quite different pilots flying them compared to what they met in Argentina and right. I guess a different scenario as well the Argentine pilots were, were desperately short of fuel uh, and couldn't engage in combat on any of the aircraft. They just had to run away. Um, but when they actually got into a full on you know, knife fight in a phone box, which Kiwis were pretty good at, yep. um, the Sea Harrier wasn't quite so invincible. <laughs> yep. that, that's one thing too, around that time, um, the 
RNZF was looking at replacing the Skyhawks and um, they, one of the options they looked at was the Harrier. Uh, was it the Sea Harrier they were looking at or was it uh, ground-based, uh, land-based? Yeah, pro I don't think it was ever seriously looked at as an option. Okay. Um, probably the Sea Harrier had been a better option because it had a radar and it was a bit more multi-role, whereas the RF Harriers didn't have a radar and that really you know, limited them to ground attack only. Right, right. Uh, and I guess after that, uh, but experience... if we'd got them, they would have been a perfect aircraft for New Zealand. Yeah, oh, right. we subsequently okay. uh, would meet the Sea Harriers quite a lot up in uh, Singapore and Malaysia during exercises each year. Yeah, and um, they'd quite often come down for those exercises, and we'd um, yeah exercise with them doing maritime strikes and air combat, and even through their upgrades on the Harriers, they did a lot of uh, radar and weapon upgrades. Uh, and even with those, with our upgrade, you know, we could take them on easily. Um, so, yeah, we did have a bit to do with them right through till the end, really, till 2001. Right, okay. And after the Skywalks were you know, disbanded in New Zealand, a lot of our pilots went to the UK, and one of them um, went and flew Harriers. Yeah. Right, who was that? Uh, Craig Compain. Uh, Compain, oh, yeah. Compain. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, interesting. So he had to change the colour of his uniform and learn all the Navy ways and traditions. Yep, yep. So I'm sure he had an interesting career. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Don. Fantastic um, presentation and uh, a really good way to, to mark the anniversary of the 40th yeah, I anniversary. Think so. and, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a poignant uh, moment in time. As you say, the veterans are getting old on both sides and... Yep. And I know the veterans on both sides are both extremely passionate about the conflict and their part in it. Yeah. Um, and there are some lovely stories out there online as well of both Argentine and British veterans actually getting together and meeting each other. You know, captains of ships that were sunk, meeting the pilots of the Skyhawks that sunk them. And wow. yeah, there's some really, really cool stuff on there that, that, you know, not everyone has grudges. It's just really nice to see. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's excellent. Well, thank you very much. All right. Cheers, Dave. Cheers.